Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to some of you and peace out to the rest of you. You know who this is. It's the blackest ninja on YouTube signing black in again. Asking you to hit that share button for the reason you've already heard before. The message is important. The messenger only so much. This is part three of the exoneration of the educated brother. Um, in this case, I want to say that uh, in the, in the educated brother um, is joined even by those who may not have education, but who are positive. We don't really need an exoneration just for the educated brother in our community. We need an exoneration for the positive brother. See, positive brothers in the black community catch it. People don't show us any love. Um, people blame us for things we didn't do. Um, just for being positive. Now, many are going to say, well, what are you talking about, Blackheart? And, and I alluded to this in part two. You see, in the black community, when you are an adult, you're allowed to be more positive than if you are a kid or if you are a teenager. When you are a uh, kid or a teenager, your positivity is seen as being very nerdish and very disloyal to the community. So we have a different culture. Now there's a normal generation gap between generations within one culture, but ours is exaggerated. In the Western world in general, it is exaggerated, and it's more so exaggerated in the case of African Americans. Teenagers, we give license, as I've said before, to be stupid. We tolerate it and we allow it. Uh, when it comes to adults, not so much. But when you are a positive brother, um, you are subjected to stereotypes that you don't deserve, per se. The thug is stereotyped at times, but I mean, that's why they're called thugs. Ghetto guys are stereotyped for things that they may not do. By the same token, uh, positive brothers get stereotyped for having no street smarts, being completely stupid, um, and uh, being exaggeratedly naive and unaware. But not only that, the biggest difference in the life, of the, if you go from one to the other, the biggest difference you are going to notice is going to be socially. You see, in our community, when somebody does become positive, there are two types of positive brothers. One type of positive brother, and this works for sisters too, one type of positive brother um, was never really anything else. He started off positive when he was young. And he said, uh, from a young age, what he was not gonna do, especially if it was foolish, and that's who he was. That's who he's always been. So he will tell you if you get to know him, he will preach some positivity to you. The other type of positive brother uh, is a bit more vocal because that positive brother, well, he's a little different. He wasn't positive when he was younger. He had to go through that nigger phase as a teenager. He had to go through the itness stereotype phase as a teenager. When he got older, he grew up, he matured. He probably matured rather late. And when he matured, he then decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop being this nigger. I'm too old for this now. It ain't about that no more. But he had to go through a nigger phase first. Which one do we listen to the most? We will listen to the one who was an ex itness a reformed itness tell us positivity and preach to us positivity. But they still got a felony on their record, so there's certain things they can never do to really make a change. But then if you take someone who started their life off positive and they were sitting in classrooms next to the itness when they were younger and they simply learned from the mistakes of the itness without making those same mistakes themselves and they come and they tell you what's the best way and they want to mentor your kids, are the kids going to listen? No. They're not going to. Now there are exaggeratedly formal ways to speak. And understandably, if someone gets up and they talk entirely too proper, as we might say, meaning they use words that average people don't use and therefore don't understand, uh, or they use average words that people have heard without ever having 
um, heard an explanation for, then you, you, yes, you can talk over people's heads, but we tend to try to make it a little bit too down at times. As an audience, we tend to only want to listen to the positive person that still says a few cuss words and he got some tattoos and some golds from his street days or she got some kids out of wedlock from her street years. But when someone comes along and they don't seem like they ever lived that ignorant life at all and they ain't got no felonies, we don't want to listen to them because they ain't been through it first. You see, Malcolm had that experience and he did the right thing with it. But what happens if you learn from Malcolm? What is the next step? The next step is to read his books when you were young and sidestep that nigga phase, that Detroit Red. And even to sidestep the Malcolm X brother minister phase and go straight to Malik El Shabazz and pick up where he left off. That's the next step, and that's not what we're doing, neither in the community nor in the suburbs, so to speak. It really doesn't mean in the hood or the suburbs, in our community in general, we're not really doing this, and this is our mistake. We still demand that people fulfill ethnic stereotypes before we will listen to anything positive they have to say, and this is subconscious and it is conscious. And oftentimes, if you really want to know the truth, the teenagers and adult women are worse about this than men are. I would have been glad to mentor. If I could have mentored and set something up and made a comfortable living doing it in the US, I might have stayed. But I couldn't. I wasn't allowed. It was almost forbidden as if it was some sort of criminal act. So how was I supposed to go back to the, the community and mentor? when one, I never grew up in the hood, and number two, they wouldn't go and listen to me if, to a certain extent, nobody would have listened if I had lived a hood life or an idness, stereotypical life and then gone back into the hood. They wouldn't have done it. Nobody would have listened. It would have been nothing but fighting. I mean, in all honesty, in all honesty, you see this even in the African-American Muslim communities sometimes. Sometimes that happens. How do you see it? Well, you African-American, you saw an example of this in the movie Shaft, where his, he finally meets his son and then introduces the son to the grandfather, Richard Roundtree. Yeah, the original Shaft. You see it, he went into the masjid. And when the imam came in, he said to the imam, did you find Allah in a prison cell or were you born in a Muslim country? Why is that? Because if you're African American, you're expected to become Muslim when you're locked up in prison, not when you're out and you're free and your life is okay. You're not expected to. Even we African Americans make this mistake at times. So when I was over 32 and I was a Muslim and I had all my teeth in my mouth, no golds and no tattoos, there were some people that looked at me strangely. No, they were very few and they never did me any harm. And I want this to be understood, but you have to keep in mind too that what I'm getting at here is that the stereotype was still believed and accepted and they weren't correcting themselves for it. They weren't thinking critically to a certain extent. And there were plenty of African-American brothers with no tattoos and no golds in their mouths. And they were doing quite well in the community. However, they weren't as, um, they were not viewed with as much suspicion because by the time I was Muslim, they had already been Muslim for a long time. So it was, uh, they, they had a bit more established credibility from time. But what is the big deal if I am African American and I do come into it and I ain't coming through prison? What's wrong with that? Then there's doubts. Doubts about even your faith itself. Like, why didn't you learn about it in prison? Oh, okay, so you must be a spy. Yeah, this is real. That's, that's no joke. So I want you guys to understand that we're gonna have to, like I said, we're gonna have to get rid of a lot of ways of thinking that we just, we just don't wanna get rid of. You see, we have set up here and enshrined and made sacred things that are dysfunctional. And this is why we're dealing with what we're dealing with. We have taken things that, are, that we've taken dysfunction and tried to make it something that we, that has to be upheld in the name of our own identity. That means that we are still defining ourselves 
by somebody else's negative stereotypes, namely our enemy's negative stereotypes. This is largely why the educated brother can't go in and mentor and be well received. This is one of the reasons why we can no longer blame educated brothers and even just positive brothers in general who don't go back in and mentor. We're not ready for them to. I hope this has been a benefit. Black Heart, sign of Blackout. Assalamu alaikum.